Do you have a Bible? If you do, and I recommend you bring one. Uh, thank you, sir. John chapter 6. As you're turning there, I want you to contemplate something for me. Is there anybody at any time throughout the course of your life that has invested in your life? I mean, invested in you, took an interest in you, recognized that there was um, something that they could do for you. And let me apologize over on this side of the sanctuary over here. We had a couple of lights blow out, so it's a little dark over here. That's not intentional. I don't say, I don't want to see any of these people turn the lights out on them. And we'll get lights changed. But I mean, is there anybody that's invested in your life, really made a significant investment? I want you to ask yourself five questions as we just, just as a way of opening up. I want you to ask yourself five questions. When did they invest in your life? Just track, just track back and think about it. Uh, whether you were a kid or whether you're an adult or anywhere in the middle, when did they invest in your life? It could have been a coach. It could have been a parent. It could have been a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a boss. I don't know. But, but when did somebody invest in your life? Number two, what did they invest in your life? Was it money? Was it time? Was it wisdom? Was it effort? Was it support? Was it encouragement? What did they invest into your life? Number three, why? Why did they do that? What did they see in you that, that made you worthy of that investment? They felt like, you know what, I can alter the course of my life and I can add something to this young person or this older person or this person. Why? What do you think that they saw in you that they would do that? How did they do it? Did they do it arrogantly? Did they do it, you know, very humbly? Did they do it like you needed to have somebody grab you by the nape of your neck and get you moving or they were just able to help you along? How, how did they do it? And then lastly, which I think is probably the most important, what have you done with that investment? Was it a waste of time? Was it a waste of money? Was it a waste of energy? Should they have maybe given it to somebody else or given their time to somebody else? What have you done with it? Because life is all about passing it on. It's all about being involved. It's all about making it happen. And I want you to think about that. When Jesus came, Jesus came because he had something to invest. And if we were to say when, we'd have to go all the way back to the cross. If we were to say why, it's because he loved us. If we were to say what, it would be his death, his burial, his resurrection, the return of his spirit, his blessings, uh, his love, all those things. If we were to say how, it would be sacrificially that he gave it all, every bit of it. And then if I were to ask you, what have you done with that investment? Only you can answer that. What have you done with it? In John chapter six, when Jesus came, Jesus came, and, and this is our final FaceTime message. I've entitled it, The Secret to My Success. If you're successful in life in any way, that doesn't mean you don't have failures. I mean, you know, you're, you're tracking towards making a difference somewhere. But when Jesus came, there were those who, who really struggled. In this whole FaceTime series, I've dealt with individuals, whether it was Moses or Elijah or Isaiah or Worth last week, who I thought did an amazing job. And don't you appreciate Worth? Just, just such a good job that he did. Thank you for that. But today I want to talk about the disciples because the disciples are much more you. Uh, it would be Jesus up here and he's sharing something. And then what are you going to do with what Jesus is going to invest in you? What will you do with that? And will you receive it? Will you take it further? Will you pass it on? What will you do with that? And we discover that in the Christian life that it is not as easy as we would like for it to be. And what are we doing with it? Jesus in the Gospel of John reveals himself in seven different ways. And they're known as the great I am statements. And so he makes certain statements. I am the light of the world was one of those great statements. 
But in this particular passage, Jesus declares himself and reveals himself as the bread of life. In doing so, uh, it comes right on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000. And so these people that are following Jesus that have been tracking him all over the place, and here's the point, they were tracking him before he fed them. The reason that they fed them was that there were so many there and the disciples were like, we need to send these people away because we can't feed them all. And Jesus said, no, I want to do that. And of course, one of them came and said, hey, here's some loaves and fishes. And then they fed you know, a couple of fish and five loaves and they fed 5,000 people. And then uh, when they started, they kept on following him. And as they kept following him and they kept looking for more that he was offering, Jesus kind of said, hey, I just want you guys to know because you keep hammering me about more of these miracles and more food. I want you to know I am the bread of life. And like, what are you talking about? And as he began to have this conversation with them, they were having some challenges with it. And Jesus makes a comment. He says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you have no part with me. And they're like, okay, time out. We, we can't go there. We can't go there. And now they're getting ready to end their relationship with Jesus after all this investment. Look in your Bible, John chapter six, in verse 60, I want you to pick up after Jesus has talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which is a spiritual truth, here's what happens. These people respond this way. It says, therefore, and this is not on the screens. It says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand that? Can I give you a more literal translation of this from the original language? It says, man, that is hard to hear, and I don't want to hear anything else like that. I did not sign up to follow you to hear that kind of stuff. I, I, I'm okay with this lighthearted stuff. I'm okay with the feeding. I'm okay with the miracles. I'm okay with the healings. I'm okay with all that. But I didn't, I don't even need to hear that. I don't even want to talk about that. Let's not get into that area, is basically what they were saying. And it says, When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples complained about this, he said to them, well, Does this offend you? And watch what he says. He says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who would not believe and who would betray him. And so he says, therefore I've said to you that no one can come to the me unless it has been granted by my father. From that time. In other words, number one, he offended them in the sense that they didn't understand this eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. And he ended their relationship whenever he said, hey, listen, it's not on your terms how you get saved. It's on God's terms how you get saved. And you get saved God's way. And they're like, okay, that's it. That's enough. That's enough. I, I, I think that I have something to do with my life. I think I have something to do with my eternity. I think I have something to do with my salvation. And he's like, no, that's not the way that it works. The only one that can come to the Father is the one that the Father draws to me. And they're like, okay, that's enough. And so it says this, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. Now watch his response. Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Peter responds this way. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have, all, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, well, hang on, Peter, for a second. We have come to know that. Did I not choose you, I, the Son of God? Did I not choose you, 12? And one of you is the devil. And he was speaking of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who betrayed him, being one of the 12. What a passage of Scripture. This particular FaceTime message is not a lighthearted message. It's a message that really is a challenging message and one that while I've been away on vacation and I've really kind of been praying about the Lord, what is the final message you want me to bring? And here it is. And so let me just start this by saying that one of the greatest days in my life was on January the 6th of 1980. It is the year that I married or the day that I married my wife, Terry. And for those of you who know my testimony, you know, and here's Robin down here, Robin and Greg. And Robin knows as good as anybody. She was there the whole time. Uh, I asked Terry to marry me three times. Now, she said yes the first time and the second time and the third time. Only the third time she said, do you want to marry me or don't you? 
And the problem was that my self-esteem was so low that I could not believe that she wanted to marry me. Now, I was burned whenever I was real young and I had scars all over my face and I hadn't had them fixed or plastic surgery or anything. And so, you know, this face right here, it may not look like it, but it's worth about $80,000, at least in medical bills. And so, uh, and, and even then, uh, my brother should say, well, you may have spent 80000 Kenny, but you still look like a bus wreck to me. And I was like, thank you, bro. I appreciate that. They were only kidding. They were only kidding. Uh, but nonetheless, I couldn't believe that she wanted to marry me, and, and, but it was the, one of the best days of my life. And, and let me tell you, some people have asked me, because on January the 6th of 2020, guess what? I will celebrate my 40th wedding anniversary. Now, somebody's asked me, what is the secret to your success? And I'll tell you what it is. It is not that I get to wake up beside her every single morning or my hope to wake up beside her every single morning. It's not that need. It is not the need that, I, that she wakes up with this same enthusiastic passion about me or I wake up with enthusiastic passion about her every day that we have to always be hugging or holding hands, but we do. But still, it's, it's not that. It is not that we have to watch our figures and watch our weight so that we look exactly the same as the day that we were married because, son, did we ever look good on that day. We were 18 years old. I mean, what does an 18-year-old look like? I was thin. I was, I was like Chinese food, baby. You know, I, I mean, it was, so nonetheless, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It wasn't that. Let me tell you what it was. It was when I stood before a minister, I vowed to her and she vowed to me that for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, in the good days and the bad days, it was till death that we part. What happened was I made a commitment. I didn't make a decision. I did not decide to get married. We committed to marriage. Now let me tell you, there's a big difference between a decision and a commitment. A decision is rooted and grounded in circumstance. Every day you're faced with different circumstances, so every day you have to make different decisions. A few months back, at the end of last year, you know that we had a major storm here. And as we had a major storm, many of you lost roofs, trees went down, houses were injured, cars were torn up, floods happened to you. And so I had to make a decision for the church, a decision for our staff. And so from September all the way until uh, February, our staff was working every single day doing roofing, uh, cutting trees, rebuilding homes, mudding out, uh, things like that. And I asked the church, I said, guys, we can't do everything we've been doing because I need to make a decision. This is a moment of circumstance where we have to do something, but we'll ultimately come back. And so we've, we've successfully spun back around and restarted all over again doing the other things. So we had to make a decision. I had to make a decision of uh, where do we spend this money? Whose house do we do? Uh, do we open up the church? What Sunday school classes can we have or not have? We had to shut down the A building. There were a lot of decisions that were involved in there. But can I tell you one decision that never crossed my mind? Hmm, we've had this tragic storm. What a terrible circumstance. I wonder if I should stay married to Terry. Because you see... The circumstance has nothing to do with my commitment to my wife or my covenant with my wife. It's not circumstantial. It is covenantal. It is a commitment. And that is why whenever you make a commitment to something, you, there's usually vows associated with it or a contract associated with it that says, doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If you go to buy a house, you know what? They could care less whether you lost your job or not, right? They don't care that there was a storm. They don't, they don't care if the economy went up or the economy went down or you had an accident or you injured yourself. They don't care. They said, you are going to pay this much money all the way to the end, period, because it's a commitment, not a decision. You didn't decide to buy a car. You committed to buy a car. You don't decide to buy a house. You commit to buy a house. They don't care what goes on. And when you commit to a marriage, you commit. You don't decide. So circumstances don't make any difference. So if we gain weight, we gain weight. If we lose weight, we lose weight. 
If we get old, we get old. If we're sick, we're sick. If we're healthy, we're healthy. It doesn't make any difference. I told Terry, I said, you know, right now at 57 years old, we have more reasons now not to want to be together than we've ever had. She's getting very expensive. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but she's got some, she's got some illnesses that are, are just chronic that she struggles with. She's got some autoimmune diseases and stuff like that. And so we have to go to the doctor a lot and she has to take medicine a lot. And there's a lot of specific things that happen and she gets worn out a lot. And, and there's a lot that happens, especially in the context of the church. And we just have to deal with it. And you know, at 18 years old, if somebody said, well, you want to marry somebody that's going to always be going to the doctors, always going to be costing us much money. You got to help her out of the bed, push her up the steps and all the, and I'm gonna be like, are you crazy? No, I don't want to do that. But now, later on down the road, it's like, I, I, I love her now more than I ever have. And I'm so grateful that I can be there in the difficult days because I made a commitment. You know, the, the second, I don't want to say the second, great, but the, traveling on chronologically, one of the great moments in my life was whenever I made a commitment to Jesus. January, or February 28th of 1989, when I met Jesus as my Savior and my Lord, uh, I made a commitment to him. I didn't decide to get saved. I didn't even know you needed to be saved. He found me. And whenever I received Christ, I made a commitment to him. And when I did, uh, it was a commitment. I made a commitment to the Lord that my service will end on the day that I die. It will not end because of any circumstance or anything else that's going on. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I don't choose to not be a part of his life or a part of his ministry because some circumstance happens because it's a commitment. So I, I, I want you to realize that today, more and more and more professed believers today are tossing their commitment to the side to Jesus because it's becoming increasingly more difficult to stand for him in a world that's becoming much more belligerent to him. See, today there's some things that aren't popular that Jesus died for. The sanctity of life, sobriety, morality, gender identity, valuable things that are not things to beat somebody over the head with, but, but they are things that Christ put out there so that we could live and live an incredible life. But today, if you stand for any of those things, and I don't mean go out there and be, I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about being you know, argumentative. Or, I'm just talking about just, I believe this. I believe that every life is valuable. Whether that life is in the womb, out of the womb, whether that life is old or sick uh, or, or, or physically handicapped, that it's, it's a life and it's valuable. And I believe that. Because God said that, that, that we should appreciate every single life. I don't care whether you're red, 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 black, yellow, or green. You are of equal value. Every person is. And so we don't need to talk about racism. We need to talk about value. Our values in life. But if you stand for that today, there's some challenges. And so what has been the response of today's professed believers? Well, let's just change God. Let's change God. Romans 1 talks about this uh, downward spiral that we go on in walking away from the Lord, that we suppress this truth and then we try to hide it away and we don't want to pay attention to it. And ultimately, we, we begin to serve the creature rather than the creator and we exchange the truth of God for the lie. And then we can, what we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to keep the church, but we need to uh, expel its owner. We need to keep the church we just need the church like the church at Laodicea that thinks they're really rich and wealthy and powerful when they were really, in reality, were naked, blind, poor, and wretched. But we, we need to keep the church because church has such power. We make money here and, you know, we get paid here. And if you're a business person, you can come join a church and you got a, plenty of people that you can kind of uh, go out there and find business relationships with or, or stuff that you can buy or sell or whatever. So the church is very powerful. Uh, very, we don't need to keep that. We just need to expel its owner because if we do, then we can expel all the difficult messages. We can expel all the difficult things for us to hear or listen to. And we can just touch on the stuff that makes us all feel real good. Because if we ever have to feel bad, it might be that uh, from this time forward, we not following you anymore. It's easy to do that. Today, there's a Christless, spiritless church that sort of resembles what Jesus was doing, but he's on the outside. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said these words. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens that door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. 
It's tragic to think today that Jesus could be on the outside of our walls. That we're in here holding religious services, but he's not a part of it because we don't want to hang on to those things. When I was on vacation, I listened to a number of, of um, what is today known as today, the America's most famous, most powerful, most influential ministers, and they were talking about church growth. And throughout their entire conversations, I listened to hours of podcasts while I was away, and I kept listening for a couple of things and there was missing in every single one of them. And it was any, re any representation whatsoever of the Holy Spirit of God in the name of Jesus. See, it was more about uh, our authority structures, our systems, our processes, uh, our leaders, uh, volunteers, uh, how, how do we do this and how do we do that and structure and all that kind of stuff. They just never happened to mention the name of Jesus. And they never happened to mention the power of the Holy Spirit of God. See, today we work with a church that operates much more powerfully on cash than they do on Christ. That if you got enough money, brother, you can do just about anything. Right? With the money, we can handle anything. We don't need God. We got money. Jesus said, you need to understand. You feel like you're wealthy, but you're not. The services are spectacular. They're just not spiritual. The services are financially powerful, but they are not soulishly saving. And I think that whenever we look at what these disciples went through, we begin to recognize that we need to spend some time before the Lord and ask ourselves a couple of questions. Here's what I want you to do for me this morning. And I really am gonna be as quick as I can. A long introduction, but I needed to go there. Two questions I want you to ask yourself this morning. Number one, how is your relationship with Jesus? Is it a decision or is it a commitment? Because if it's a decision, then you can say, well, I left because. Well, I'll tell you what, the church did something and I just had to leave. That's because all you've done is make a decision to escape hell, not to walk with Jesus. Well, I left because they didn't say the right thing. They parked in my parking space. They wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do. I had an idea of something that should happen in the church, and they, they shot my idea down, and so I'm out of here. You made a decision, not a commitment. I want you to ask yourself, how is your relationship with Jesus? Is it a commitment or is it a decision? Because if it's a commitment, there is no circumstance whatsoever that will alter your relationship with Jesus. It won't even come into your mind. Just like the storm, I don't think any of you who are married was thinking, you know, since that storm came, it really come to mind in that difficult circumstance, I need to divorce my wife or my husband. I don't think that came up. And it shouldn't come up in your relationship with God. Number two, I want you to think about this. If you can find someone better than Jesus, I think you ought to go serve him. But if you can't, I think you ought to commit to him today. I don't know of a savior better than Jesus. I don't know of anybody better than Jesus, but you might. And you know what God said? You know what Elijah said? If Baal is God, well, by all means, go serve him. But if God is the Lord, you ought to serve him. Make a decision. How long will you falter between two decisions? Make a decision one way or the other. And I think that you ought to make a commitment to Jesus today. So let me, uh, let me share with you that as I listen to all this stuff, Revelation 3, it came to my mind when I was listening to all these podcasts where the Bible says that Jesus said to this church at Philadelphia, he says, I know your works. And isn't that good to know that God knows what's going on? He says, I know your works. And he says, see, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. And he gave three reasons why. And I just put the numbers on there so you could see. The first one is because you have little strength. In other words, God doesn't care your fame. He doesn't care how big you are. He doesn't care who knows you. He doesn't even care how many of you are. The reason is that God works a whole lot better with little people. Big people, hard to work with. You gotta knock them off the throne before you can use them because they're so full of pride. So probably the smaller we are, the better he can use us. He gets the glory. Uh, number two, he said, you have kept my word. Where, today, I mean, it's like, I hear all kinds of stuff that is like, where did you get that from? I know it sounds real spiritual, but it didn't come from scripture. It's not scriptural. There's a difference between being spiritual and being scriptural. He says, you've kept my word, man. That's the source of who you are and the source of what's going on. You've kept my word. And thirdly, you have not denied my name. Do we still love the name of Jesus? Do we still preach the name of Jesus? Do we still use the name of Jesus? You know, it's popular today in the music industry that we can sing awesome Christian songs. We just don't need to use the name of Jesus. 
We'll implement love. Love is a good substitute for the name of Jesus. Can I tell you something? At the name of love will nobody bow. But at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that he is God. One day, it's gonna happen. So, what is the secret to our success? It's a commitment. It's a covenant. It's a real commitment. So I want you to see, how does Jesus respond to a group of disciples who are not real happy about the message that he's bringing? And that could be us today. How does he respond to that? Because, you know, I, I, I've had people say, yeah, pastor, you're, you're, you, you were harsh this morning. You were mean. I, I brought somebody with me and they said, you were too mean. They're not coming back. What would Jesus say? Let me give you three things. Number one, he will not, Jesus will not, he will not lie to make you comfortable and he will not change to make it easy. He will not lie to make you comfortable and he will not change to make this easy. It is what it is. So what does he say? Look in those first verses in verses 60 and 61. Here's what the Bible says there. He goes on to say this. He says, or 61 and 62, when Jesus knew in himself that the disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the son of man ascend to where it was before? Uh, can I tell you this? If you balk at the offense, you'll never, ever, ever be able to handle the mission. Jesus is telling them he's not crucified yet, he's not risen from the dead yet, he's just making his way and he's trying to give them a spiritual truth and he says, you gotta eat my flesh and drink my blood and they're like, oh, oh, stop, that's it, that's it. And he's like, hey, listen, if you're already in trouble at this, you ain't ever gonna get over here to this. Because he said, what did he say? Does that offend you? Did that offend you? Jesus, Jesus, here's what he didn't say. Oh my, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Uh, we're gonna give you a free gift and we're gonna like, uh, we're gonna wash your car or, or please, 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 please don't, don't go anywhere. Don't be mad. Please come back. I'm so sorry that we offended you. That's not what he said. That is not what Jesus said. Not at all. He said, does that offend you? Well, if that offends you, what do you think is going to happen when you get over here? He did not try to smooth over the offense because he realized that to change the offense would be for him to have to change the mission, and he cannot do that. He must go to the cross. It was going to be a reality. And if you're uncomfortable to walk with him as the bread of life, how hard is it going to be to walk with him as the slain lamb of God that is now an embarrassment? How are you going to do that? Number two, you cannot see the things of the Spirit through the eyes of the flesh, one of the challenges we find today in biblical interpretation is that we have a lot of lost people that are saying, here's what the Bible says, but guess what? You can't understand what the Bible says unless you're saved, and even then, it's a challenge. Without the aid of the Holy Spirit and good study practices, it's really hard to know what it really says. And so Jesus says these words. In verse 63, he says, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So he, he said, hey, look, don't, don't get caught up. You're thinking, you're thinking. You just heard a word I said. You immediately went to a fleshly issue. That is not what I'm trying to tell you. There's a higher level of understanding that I'm trying to get you to understand. The apostle Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians 2 when he said this. He says, the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Why? Why? He says, they can't even know them because they're spiritually discerned. So it doesn't do any good as a believer to argue with a lost person. They, they don't even have an opportunity to understand what you're talking about. They can watch your life and be drawn in and maybe start to listen, but just to argue, it's not gonna do any good. You have to spiritually understand what's going on. The point Jesus was trying to make is that he was trying to lead them to spiritual union. See, what was going on before was that we had the law and then we had our life. And he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm moving to a different arena. I, I, we need spiritual union. You need to be in full union with me. Uh, finish, finish this out. You are what you eat. He says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood because even they understood that. And he was basically saying, I'm not trying to get you to be a cannibal. I'm trying to get you to be a Christian. I want you to understand that you must receive me internally, not externally. This is a heart issue, not a hands issue. This is a spiritual issue, not a fleshly issue. 
This is a salvation issue, not a service issue. This is something that's on the inside and we need to come together in spiritual union if we're going to make it. And you have to understand that. You cannot see spiritual things through those fleshly eyes and so we have to let some of that stuff go. Let me give you a hard saying of Jesus. I've heard, uh, as we've interviewed some staff people, uh, here's one of the things. Uh, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna sacrifice my family on the altar of the ministry. I don't think that God would ever ask me to do that. Okay, uh, let's, let's, let's read this. Luke chapter 14. Now let's turn around and read this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he can't be my disciple. Can you reconcile that with that statement? Do you think that God would ever hurt your family? Of course not. Of course not. But to place them in between God as a, uh uh-uh, this is it, is to put your family in a very precarious position that that is the people that are now challenged to get your attention. That's a dangerous place to be. That's a hard saying. But you know what? You know how Jesus said it? Because it's a true saying. He doesn't want you to hate your family in terms of like, I don't like them anymore, but he wants to make sure that you don't put them in a priority position in between him and somebody else because he'll take better care of your family than you ever will. When you try to take care of it, there's gonna be injury to both and that's something that he can't handle. Can't see spiritual things through fleshly eyes and if you see see that wrong, it's because you're looking at it through the flesh. Number three, the real offense is that salvation comes from God and so you're gonna have to go to him. This was the thing that they finally said, "Uh uh-uh, we're done. We're done. He said, that is why my father said to me, I know that some of you don't believe, and this is why my father said to me that you can't come unless the father grants it to you. In other words, here's, what, here, here's the truth. There are those that would say, well, you know, there's a lot of ways to heaven. No, there's not. There's just, there's just one. There's just one. It's just Jesus. Oh, you Christians, you're so exclusive. Are we? Are, don't y'all like exclusivity? Don't you? Aren't you glad that when you go out to the mall and you go to get in your car that everybody out there doesn't have the key to your car? That only you do? Aren't you glad when you go to your house only you have the key to your house? And so he says, I want to go to your house. Well, just use your key because they're all the same key. No, you you don't want it that way, right? You don't want, aren't you glad that that your husband or your wife, that that's exclusive in your relationship? Should be. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad that I don't have the numbers to your bank account? Like I was like, man, I got all the money in the church. Got records of their accounts, and we just download that stuff. Well, how would you do there? It's like, well, you know, God says that we should share and share alike. So I figured I'd get some of your money. You wouldn't appreciate that, would you? Whenever it comes to Jesus, here's what God says. He says, you can't come to him the way you want to come to him. You have to come to him the way that God wants you to come to him. And God says in verse 40 of chapter 6, he said, this is the will of my father who sent me that every person, every person, listen, who sees the son and believes on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up on that last day. In other words, God's decision was to send his son and salvation comes through Jesus. You don't come through Jesus, you don't come. You don't come. What does, it, what does that mean? Let me say it another way. You don't come through Jesus, you go to hell. Well, now you're being mean. No, now I'm being honest. And, and you say I'm gonna go to hell forever. No, absolutely not. I would never tell you that because it's not true. You're just gonna go to hell for a short time. And then there's gonna be a short time later that he's gonna come back and I'm gonna talk about this next month that he's gonna pull all those people up there in hell. He's gonna judge it and then you'll be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever. That just happens to be true. You don't have to believe it doesn't make it any less true. You know, uh, my, my brother-in-law uh, works for the DA's department. And I've shared with this with you before, but it, it, it it's recently happened and it's tragic. I, I hear from bicyclers and joggers and stuff all the time. It's like, aren't you the uh, uh, chaplain for the highway patrol? I'm like, yeah. It's like, well, you need to tell the highway patrol or you need to tell the police or don't you know the sheriff? Yes, I know him. Uh, You need to tell them that they need to start giving tickets to these cars that are running us off the road that don't let us ride our bicycles and stuff like that. And I said, I'll see what I can do, but I got a word for you, okay? Uh, In the meantime, yes, they're supposed to give you space. And in the meantime, I want you to remember this phrase, you're still dead. Yes, the car should have given right away to the person who is lying on the road dead. Legally, they're still dead. 
Better watch out for yourself. You can say, well, there should be other ways to heaven. Maybe there should be. You're still in hell. You can argue all you want to. You're still in hell. And they're like, oh, that's, that's enough. That's enough. There's got to be more ways than that. That's enough. And from that time, they walk no more. Secondly, I want you to see, though, really, really important to see this. Choose carefully. Choose carefully because God will acknowledge your choice. In verses 66 and 67, it says this, from that time, many of his disciples walked, went back and they walked no more with him. And then Jesus said to the 12, you also want to go away? Because see, Jesus was secure in his mission. He knew what he had to do and he knew that he could not not do it. And so when he looked at those folks, it's like, do you want to leave too? Let me just give you three real quick thoughts because time will escape me here. Uh, three quick thoughts that I'm just going to put on the board, okay? Number one, he did not try to keep them. Number two, he didn't go after them. And number three, he didn't try to keep anybody that was left. Do you want to go? Go. Uh, do y'all want to go too? Go ahead. They're, they're leaving. Do you want to go with them? Go ahead and go. You know one of the great challenges of today's church I'll tell you a great challenge of today's church, trying to keep you here. Oh, we can't do this and we can't say that and we can't act this way because one of the greatest tools that a church man will do, I'll leave. I will leave and take everybody with me. I can't tell you the numbers of people that have said to me, there was a person here one time, been many years ago, you wouldn't, so you don't know who this is, but many years ago, there was a person who came here and they were a person of influence, a person of affluence, and a person of money. And I remember it was the time when we had full choir all the time, and it was uh, a 100% white choir. Not because we meant for it to be, it just was. It was basically a 100% white church. And, and we had one lady that came to our church who was African-American. Wonderful singer, really good friend. She joined the choir. And I was thrilled to have her in the choir. She sat beside uh, the, light, the wife of this man. And I remember being in the office and he, he called me up one day and said, Kenny, uh, Pastor Kenny, I need to come over and talk to you. So okay, come on over. And so he came in, he sat down with me, he says, I... He said, man, I hate to come here, but, but there's something I need to tell you. It's like, okay. He says, you know so-and-so, I do. And you know my wife, I do. Well, they, you know that they, they sing in the choir together. And I said, I do. He said, well, my wife has an issue with this lady. And I said, why? And she said, because she's black. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, listen, I am happy to help. I, 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 thank you for coming to see, talk to me because, you know, prejudice is one of them really challenging things and I understand where it comes from and I think I can help walk your wife through it. He said, uh, that's not exactly what I meant. Uh, 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 now, he had bought choir robes and spent thousands and thousands here. I said, I'm as oblivious as I could possibly be. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He says, I need you to ask this other lady to leave the choir. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? Why? Because my wife is uncomfortable sitting beside her. I said, well, well, I will be glad to help your wife through. This is a challenge, and we'll work through this. He's like, no, nah, let me make it more clear to you. And this is almost verbatim. He said, let me make it more clear to you. If you don't tell that woman to get out of our choir, I will take my wife my children, and most importantly, my money. And we will leave this church. And I said, well, God bless you as you go. <laughs> Here's what he said. He said, you mean to tell me, you mean to tell me as after I've put over $100,000 in these offering plates that you're going to let me go? I said, yes, sir, I am. I am not for sale. That is a wrong attitude. And God can help you. Please don't go. Now they left. I didn't chase them. I didn't try to get them to stay. And for the others that got mad with me for not keeping them here, I said, do you want to go? We're not going to do that. That's a hard saying, isn't it? But it's, it's, it, you know, this is where we're supposed to be. Number three, if Jesus isn't enough, well, what is? 
What is? You really need to discover what that is. In verses 68 and 69, Peter said to Jesus, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the ones that have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so here's a couple of things I just want you to see and we'll be done. Okay, there's a great truth that I want you to see here. Every single one of you are gonna make it to the end of this life. Every one of you are gonna live until you die. Every single one of you, but I'm not sure that you'll make it to eternal life. I don't care who you serve, I don't care what you do, you will make it to the end of this life, but what will be there at the end of that? And the apostle Peter didn't say, oh Lord, no, you have the miracles. No Lord, you have the grace. No Lord, uh, you have the power. You have the authority. You have the influence in this world. He wasn't even thinking about this world. He said, where are we gonna go? You're the one with the words of eternal life. In other words, there's something after this life. There's more to it than this. And I need to know what that is that's more to it than this. You're the one. And, and, and not only that, we have come to believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, and we have come to know that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Two different things. We believed you, so we followed you. We know you, so we're staying with you. Very, very different. So what are the alternatives? Where would you go? Where do you go when you leave Jesus? Who else died for you? Who else is gonna save your soul? Who else gives you grace? Who else is there on the other side? Who's preparing a home for you? Who has your family with you, with him? Who has all of that? What is your alternative? You going to the gurus that are in the world? Are you gonna go to the colleges and the universities that could care less about Jesus? Are you, are you going to the next Christless, spiritless church? Are you going to another religion? Where are you going? If you leave Jesus, you step down. You do not step up. You do not step to the side. You step down. What are your alternatives? And not only what are your alternatives, have you come to believe and to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, the Son of the living God? Have you come to know that? Has your life been a pursuit of knowing Jesus? See, we get saved, but have you ever thought about pursuing him so that you know who he is? Not serving him. You ought to serve him. But I mean pursuing God to really know who he is. And then finally, uh, you can't speak for other people because when Peter said, Lord, we've come to know and we've come to believe that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus paused for a moment. He said, hey, Peter, 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 before you go there, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you's a devil? He was referring, referring to Judas' character, son of Simon, the one who would betray him. In other words, you know, if, if we were to take a look at some of the pastors, passages of the Bible, uh, honestly, and it would say that about half of us here probably have never made a decision for Christ. But how do I, I don't know. I don't know. Jesus said, I handpicked you guys. I handpicked you. You can't tell me that everybody here is saved. Remember at the, at the Last Supper, whenever Jesus said, one of you at the table is gonna betray me, what did they say? Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? They didn't know. Judas knew. But the rest of them, I, I, don't, I don't know. How many of us know? Do you really know? I want, you to, I want you to think about this. These two questions I ask you to ask yourself. How's your relationship with Jesus? Was it a commitment or is it a decision? Have you found somebody better than Jesus? If so, by all means, go after him. But if not, man, let me encourage you to follow him. Let me close with this one last illustration. I gotta be careful how I share this story because I don't wanna, I don't wanna reveal uh, names. It's not, it's not private or anything, but I just don't wanna reveal any names. It is personal. Uh, recently, I heard of a, um, a situation where there's a person who is really close to death. This person is in their 80s. They have been in church since before they were born grown up in the church and served the church pretty much all the days of their life, all the way up until it was impossible. This person is now suffering with dementia and that dementia has been steadily growing and growing and growing and growing to the point that this person's not really there. Every now and then, maybe just, just, just a fleeting moment of, of recognition, but not, not there much. Very faithful, it's in the Lutheran faith, very faithful, I should say, Lutheran church. And, and um, 
for a brief instant, not even a brief, but, but, but actually a moment of total, totally being lucid, like there, present here. I'm here, I'm back. This is me and I know who you are. And another person that was there that's close, a family member, um, realizing this person is struggling, their husband has already passed. And, and so it's like, sometimes you get to that place where somebody is, it seems like they're having a hard time making the transition. And you're wondering, why are they staying? Why can't they go? Why won't they let go? And so this person was trying to help them say, it's, it's okay, uh, we'll be fine. And if, if, if you're ready to go, it's okay, we, we'll make it, we love you and, and go be with your husband and, and, and it's, it's okay. This person responded, I'm afraid to die. Now they're there, they're lucid, they're totally there, 100%. Why are you afraid to die? You know Jesus as your savior, you've been in church all of your life, you've served, all, why would you be afraid to die? I've never believed in Jesus. What, what do you mean you've never believed in Jesus? You've been in church your whole life. Yeah, I've served the church and I've served faithfully in the church and I love the church. I just don't believe in Jesus. I can't see him, so I don't believe in him. I don't believe that he's my savior. I don't think he paid for my sins. Not lucid anymore. Still living. Still living an entire lifetime of service to God without ever believing in him? Will this person pass on into eternity without Christ? I don't know. I don't know. I've been praying since I've spoken to this person that God will bring her back one more time to be lucid and to be open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be saved even if it's in the final moments of her life. Jesus said, don't speak for somebody else because you don't know. You don't know. I am floored by this person that they're not saved. Floored. Would have never known had it not been the words out of her own mouth and the level of unbelief so powerful in the midst of a lifetime of service to God. I don't understand it. I just know that it's true. How's your relationship with God? Did somebody die and you walked away? Did you lose a job and you walked away? Oh, there's a better offer in the world. They got a better retirement plan. They pay more money. They, they do other things and you walked away. What circumstance will cause you to walk away? It needs to be a commitment. And if you've never committed to Jesus, I want to encourage you to commit to him today. Have you been saved? There's only one way. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, he's paid for your sin. I know he's paid for your sin, so I don't judge your sin and I don't judge you. What I do is offer the grace of God. I offer you the opportunity to be saved. I love you. I hope you will. We will celebrate with you. We will baptize you. We will walk with you. We will teach you because it is our greatest joy to reach our hands out to sinners of which we all still are. But living by the grace of God, we will still do that. But there's only one way. And man, don't wait until it's too late. Don't go through your whole life sitting in this pew knowing good and well that you're sitting there and you think you got everybody else fooled. But down inside, you know that you don't believe. You know that you've never asked. You know that you've never made that decision. If that's the case, then let me encourage you today. Come make that decision. Man, we'll rejoice with you. We're not going to say, oh man, are you kidding? Church, stop. Check this guy out. No, we're not going to do that. We'll just celebrate with you. Okay? Stand with me. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to stand here today and prayerfully represent what is a very hard word in your book. That you love us, but you do not force us. That you die for us and that you will save us, but you don't make us. But you offer, you invite. That's why we call it an invitation we don't hook people in the pew and drag them down front, but we sure do 
want them to know that they're welcome here and that they can come. But we can't change the message and we can't change the mission to make people feel more comfortable to come and receive you the way that you want. So Father, draw today. If there are those who have been saved, but they've been kind of living a life where they're watching, they're spectators more than they are servants and they want to commit their life today, I pray that you'll help them to commit. We'll receive all who will come. The remainder, they're free to go. Lord, I pray they'll kind of hang out and go to Cafe Northside and really support our young people. We always complain that today's generation doesn't want to work and we're trying to raise a generation that will. And if we can offer them some support, man, will it ever go a long way. And I pray that uh, a meal today over there, even if they drop spaghetti in our lap accidentally, it's the first time they're kind of doing it on their own, that they would know that we're behind them. We thank you for that. Draw those who will come. Bless those who do not. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.